peace when you ought not have peace. Joy when you ought not have joy. Power when you ought not have power. Dr. Tony Evans says that's what we get when God's power invades our earthly situation. When you would normally quit, you still got fighting power. Why? Because the spiritual is infusing you in the physical. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. For too many people, there's church life and real life, two different realities that weaken our faith and perpetuate our problems. Let's join Dr. Evans as he explains how all that can change when God becomes our banner of victory. Our name for God today is Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. It comes out of Exodus chapter 17. And remember, the names of God most normatively come out of the situations in life, scenarios people found themselves in that needed God's divine intervention. Usually they were problems. And these problems needed divine intervention. And so a name of God would be assigned or God would use that problem to reveal himself. So the bad news today is life has problems. The good news today is God has a name for them. That whatever you're facing, there is a name for God that is applicable to the crisis that you are in. The people of God were discouraged. You always know when you are discouraged. You always know when your faith in God has waned. And the proof of that can be made clear by the amount of complaining you do. Complaining as a way, we all complain from time to time, but complaining as a modus operandi, that is, as the way you are flowing, you're operating by complaints, it's normative to complain, is often an indication of a waning of faith. God's people in Exodus chapter 17 had been complaining because of the lack of water when they had camped at Raphidim. And they complained and God provided. The highlight of their complaint is verse 7, when they said at the end of the verse, is the Lord among us or not? Where is God when you need him most? That was the question that was on the people's mind because things were dry. No water. Things were dry. And life does get dry sometimes. And you need some refreshment. So they just come out of this problem with the water. And isn't it, isn't it just like life? Soon as one thing gets fixed, another thing breaks. And it like that, you know, you pay one bill and another bill goes crazy. You know, just as just soon as you think you, you, you've gotten over the hump, there's a new hill bidding you to climb it. Well, the scenario is pointed out in chapter 17, verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Raphidim. Raphidim is a rugged desert place near Mount Horeb where the water source had been very low, God's people were weary, and wouldn't you know it, now they've got a deal with Amalek. Amalek has shown up, and Amalek wants to fight. Amalek wants to resist them. Just when it looks like things have gotten better, they finally got some water, things go south again. And it looks like the Lord is not on their side. Well, they face this attack. Amalek is from the line of Esau. So these were people who were connected to the Jews coming through the line of Esau. So Moses says to his understudy, Joshua, choose men for us, go out and fight Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek 
Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. It came about when Moses held his hand up, Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. Interesting. The problem was when his arms got heavy, his situation got worse. Because when his arms came down, Amalek prevailed. Amalek is any force of evil that seeks to keep you from achieving the purposes of God. So the heavier or the more weighty the spiritual became, the more he began to lose in the earthly situation he was battling. His arms got heavy. So what did he do? Look at the verse here. The verse says, they took a stone, put it under him, And he sat on it, and Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus, his hands were steady until sunset. Guess what he did? He had two brothers with him, one named Aaron and one named her. And you know, their only job was to hold his hands up. Their job was to not allow the heaviness of the spiritual, making contact with God, go down. Because they knew if he lost sight of the spiritual due to the tiredness of his arms, the situation was not going to get better by getting rid of the spiritual. Israel would not prevail. The dependence on God would have to be held up. But sometimes in life, you get tired. The reason why God wants you part of a local body is so that you're connected to an Aaron and a her. Some people who will hold you up when stuff gets heavy. When you are tired and you want to quit and you want to, come on, somebody knows what it is. When you wanted to quit throwing the towel and there was somebody whispering in your ear, don't you quit, don't you stop. I'm going to hold you up. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to support you. I'm not going to let you go down. The reason you need somebody in your life who will keep your hands Godward is because sometimes things get heavy. And you don't want to pray and you don't want to talk to God and you don't want to hear the Bible and you know, things get heavy and you need somebody because look, if there were no Aaron and there were no her and things got too heavy and he dropped, everybody lost because Amalek, evil, prevailed. They're so engaged in the fight that they are totally unaware that their winning or losing had nothing to do with their fight. Their winning or losing didn't matter how, how, you know, it, it had nothing to do with the power of positive thinking. I'm more determined. He ain't going to beat me. I'm going to beat him. All that may have been going on, but their winning or losing had nothing to do with that. It had to do with Moses' arms. If his arms were up, Israel prevailed. If his arms were down, Israel didn't prevail, no matter how determined they were. Could it be that the reason why your Amalek won't go away is because you think it's what you're doing that will determine the outcome. Now, what you're doing is important. There is a role you play down here, but what you are doing is never sufficient if there's evil tied to the problem. What many of us don't realize is many of the problems we're facing have to do with demons. They're just using folk. So, So you're absolutely correct when you say you ain't nothing but the devil. Behind a lot of this stuff we're dealing with is demonic expression. So you just dealing with your physical is not addressing that. You may push it away for a while. You may, you may, you may manage it for a while, but you won't address it unless heaven gets involved. Unless there is a banner. Joshua fought on the ground. Moses went up to the mountain with support. Verse 13 is the conclusion. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. He won. Write this down. Verse 14, the Lord says to Moses, you write this down in a memorial and you recite it to Joshua. In other words, put it on the record. 
So I'm trying to give us the record today. And the record I'm trying to give you is this. When you're fighting your battles, whatever battle those are that you're fighting, you do two things, not one. You give your best in the valley while holding up the banner on the hill. And you get all the help you need to keep your hands high as you wait to overwhelm that which is right now overwhelming you. You may be under the circumstances. I cannot guarantee there will be no Amalek's. I can guarantee Amalek doesn't have to have you. But you've got to be on that mountain. There must be that spiritual presence, that spiritual commitment. And so he says, write it in the book that I will utterly block out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's get this straight. I'm going to read too fast. What I want to write down in the book is I want to get rid of all of Amalek, not part of Amalek. See, the reason why some of us are losing is we still want to play around with Amalek. We want to get rid of half of Amalek, most of Amalek. God says, I want to blot out Amalek. I want to fully deal with the evil associated with the situation. See, what we want to do is uh, have a part-time victory because we like some of the folk in Amalek. Okay? We don't want to blot them all out. Let me tell you why he wanted to blot out Amalek. This is very important. He wanted to blot out Amalek because he knew that if he did not get rid of Amalek, it would come back. It would come back to haunt you. Listen, if you have cancer, You don't want like a little piece of cancer hanging around and be all excited while we got most of it. Because it will come back with a vengeance. It will come back with a vengeance. He says, I will utterly block them out. 1 Samuel 15, God tells Saul, get rid of Amalek. He tells him in 1 Samuel 15, you get rid of Amalek and you get rid of them all. He got rid of most of them, but kept a few around as trophies. He kept some trophies around of look what I did with Amalek. God said, get rid of them all. He said, let me hang out. Let me keep a few so that I can. And then he went to church. It says he went to sacrifice and worship God. God, look what I did. I got rid of most of Amalek. God sent Samuel to Saul. And Samuel said, you are no longer king, for you did not listen and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And then he gives them that famous verse which says, obedience is better than worship, than sacrifice. I said, get rid of them all. You kept a few around, whether for sympathy, whether for bragging rights, you kept a few around. The man who killed Saul was from Amalek. Because he did not follow God, his murderer, or the one who assisted him in his suicide, was from Amalek. When God says get rid of it all, he's not trying to be mean. He knows it'll come back with a vengeance. He says, I want to utterly block them out. I want to remove them. I want to get rid of all the evil because some of us are still hanging out with some of the evil. It keeps coming back. We don't have it as full-time evil. We have it as part-time evil. Or maybe we don't have it as part-time evil. We just give it visitation rights. But then visitation rights become squatters' rights. And now it makes itself home again. And you wonder why it's worse. Because it says, I want to blot out Amalek, which represents the evil that is resisting you from reaching God's purpose for your life. He says, you must address it all. You don't hang out with a little bit of pornography. Just because you've gotten rid of a lot of it. So we think because we got rid of half Amalek, that there is victory. He says, I want to blot it out. 
I want to remove it completely so that there is victory completely. So you name it. that is upon you and I'm not hating what I'm trying to say is that the spiritual and the physical must be joined but the goal must be blotting it out not tinkering with it more from Dr. Evans on why a partial victory isn't enough when he continues our message in just a moment first though you can dig even deeper into today's subject and put the principles to work with the help of Tony's popular devotional experience the power of God's names 
It'll take you on a day-by-day exploration of what the biblical titles for God tell us about His nature and character and help us understand how He wants to relate with us. And to help you connect what you read with Tony's teaching, we'll send the devotional to you along with all 14 messages on CD and digital download from Volumes 1 and 2 of our current series, Knowing God's Names. All we ask in return is that you make a contribution to help us keep the alternative coming your way each day. You can get the details and make the arrangements instantly at TonyEvans.org or call our 24-hour resource request line at 1-800-800-3222 and let one of our team members help you. That's 1-800-800-3222. Well, Dr. Evans will come back with more of today's message right after this. Coming to theaters this November. We're at the Church of the Nativity here in Bethlehem, where it is believed that the birth of Jesus Christ occurred. Travel with Dr. Tony Evans as he retraces the life and human journey of the greatest being to ever walk this earth. Well, we're here in Capernaum, a place where Jesus did most of his miracles. And it is in this place that he demonstrated he truly is the Son of God. You'll travel the streets, fields, and synagogues that Jesus walked and visit the locations where some of the most powerful events recorded in the Bible took place. It is highly likely that much of what we read about Jesus' ministry in Galilee happened right here. Journey with Jesus in theaters November 15th, 16th, and 17th with Dr. Tony Evans. Visit TonyEvans.org for locations, showtimes, and to learn more. Moses built an altar and named it Jehovah Nissi. The Lord is my banner. The Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Whenever Amalek messes with you, Amalek will mess with me because I am your banner. Holding a banner, which in this case was the rod of God, You know, for us, it's flags and stuff, but back then, it could be an item. In this case, it was the rod of God. The word banner, by the way, means to glisten. Just like we have glistening on our banners, there was a glistening on the rod, uh, uh, holding up the rod of God.
God, meaning I'm going to operate underneath the banner. I'm going to operate underneath the banner. The banner is going to be over me. The banner is going to be my standard. So that raises the question, doesn't it? What's your banner and my banner today? What exactly am I supposed to hold up to deal with my realities? You know, one of the movies I saw that just blew my mind, I mean, it's probably for me one of the greatest movies I've ever seen was the movie Inception. And the movie Inception is about a dream world. This man could enter dreams. And what made it intriguing was you enter a dream and then he would enter the dream's dream. Then he entered the dreams, dreams, dream. And then he entered the dreams, 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 dream. So he had descended into four levels of dreams. Now the problem with that is reality got all confused. He's in all these dream worlds and all these dream worlds are real. So the question is, what's real and what's not? How do I know if I'm in a real world or a dream world? He has to deal with his wife and he doesn't know whether she's really here or not here because he doesn't know whether he's in reality or whether he's in a dream world. So what he created was a totem, a spinning top. A totem is a instrument designed to guide you. That's what a totem is, to steer you, guide you. So he has a totem and it's a top. And he carries his totem in his pocket. Or puts it in a safe. And if he spit the top and the top just kept spinning and wouldn't slow down and fall over, he knew he was in the dream world. But if he spun the top and the top fell over, then that meant that he was in the real world. He established ahead of time what the standard would be that he would operate under. He would know that he was in the real world by virtue of what the top did. Did it fall over or did it keep spinning? That's how he measured reality. You see, stuff in life can get so confusing, you don't know if you're coming or going. You don't know whether you're in and out. You don't know whether you're up and down. Stuff just is crazy. You need a standard outside of yourself to tell yourself, whether this is really yourself. You need something outside of you to measure you by which you will interpret reality and by which decisions will be made because you have this standard that is objective and not tied to your emotions right now, what you're thinking right now, how you're feeling right now, what you want right now. You need something outside of you to tell you reality. The standard. That which God uses, because see, some of us are operating with the enemy thinking we're operating with the Lord. Some of us are operating in falsehood, but we think we're operating in truth. Some of us going around talking about my truth, but your truth ain't the truth. It's just your temporary truth. There must be a standard by which you operate. And that brings in Jesus Christ. In Numbers chapter 21, you don't have to turn there, but it's an interesting story. The people rebel against God. Snakes come that are poisonous and bites them. In other words, there are consequences for their rebellion. The people began to cry for mercy. God said, here's what I want you to do, Moses. He says, get a pole and put a bronze serpent on it. Hold the pole up high. You tell all of Israel, watch this now, if they will look to the serpent, they will live. Everybody that looked at the serpent lived. Everybody still looking for a doctor died. Everybody still talking to their friends died. Everybody still dealing with the power of positive thinking died. Everybody trying to do better died. Everybody made promises, I'm going to do better next week than I did this week. They died. Because God only had one standard. He said, if you look, you will live. Everybody who looked lived. Everybody who had other reasons why they needed to do something else 
die. They chose their own standard based on their own thinking. The New Testament in John 3 uses that very same illustration pointing to Jesus. It says in John 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. And everybody who looks toward him will live. And everybody who doesn't will die. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much you try. If you've not learned to hold up Jesus, if you've not learned to make him the standard under which you operate, then all your hard work, all your good efforts will appeal to nothing because God says you must operate under my standard. And in John chapter 12, he says uh, that I'm going to be lifted up and I'm going to be the standard. And he says, when I am lifted up, if you point toward me, I will be your victory because a standard, a banner was a standard that declared victory. In other words, what I'm trying to say to you is while you're doing everything you're supposed to do on the ground, unless you are pointed toward Jesus Christ, unless you're operating by his will, his word, and his standard, you don't have the spiritual help you need to deal with the battles you're battling down here. If Jesus is just an addendum but not the standard, not the thing with, by which you measure whether you're in reality, God's reality, or just your own reality. Then you're just a good man, good woman doing the best that you can. Do you know that your solutions to many of your Amalek problems are right in front of you? You've been working 10 years to solve something that could have been solved by the end of the day. But God can't get you to operate under the standard or the devil makes your hands too heavy and you're too proud to have Aaron and her so that you can hold your hands up and stay pointed toward Jesus. Because if he could ever get you to keep your focus on Jesus, you would see the supernatural into the natural and bring about a change. And even if your situation doesn't change, he can change you in your situation. So that you have peace when you ought not have peace. Joy when you ought not have joy. Power when you ought not have power. Patience when you ought not have patience. When you would normally quit, you still got fighting power. Why? Because the spiritual is infusing you in the physical. You know, one of the shows I always watch, and you always watch growing up was The Wizard of Oz. Wizard of you remember Dorothy and Toto, don't you? She winds up in another world. She winds up in a whole nother environment. I mean, my girl wanted to be in Kansas, but all of a sudden there's a whirlwind that takes her to a whole nother place and she is lost and doesn't know which way to go. But then there's a, there's a witch that comes and tell her to follow the yellow brick road. All you got to do is walk down the yellow brick road because at the end of the road, there's this city called Oz. And if you, if, if you go in the city called Oz, there's a guy there, there is a God there who can show you which way to go. So she starts walking down the yellow brick road, picks up a few friends along the way, and, uh, and makes her way because she wants to go back home to Kansas. She wants to go back to her peaceful environment where she was raised. She finally gets to Oz and gets to the wizard. She says, I came here because I want to go back home to Kansas. And I can't believe the end of the movie. The end of the movie, the Wizard of Oz says, you could have gone back to Kansas any old time you wanted to. From the time you were in this mess, you could have been going back to Kansas. Because he said, all this stuff is all up in your head. And if your head was straight, all you had to do was click, 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 and you go back to Kansas. Victory was right there in front of you. Victory has been there all the time. Because all you got to do is click, 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 and you go back to Kansas. And when my girl, click, 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 all of a sudden she woke up and she was back home again. God is saying, I know you trying this and trying that and trying the other, but if you ever visit Jesus right and you go click, 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 you'll be amazed. He can flip it, twist it, turn it and tweak it and give you victory over the Amalek in your life. Dr. Tony Evans talking about how God's power can invade our earthly circumstances. If you'd like to have a copy of today's message to review on your own or pass along to a friend, you can get it as a part of Tony's current teaching series, Knowing God's Names. 
For a limited time, you can receive all 14 messages in this powerful two-volume series as our gift, including some lessons we won't have time to present on the air. And as an added bonus, we'll also include that companion daily devotional I mentioned earlier, Experience the Power of God's Names. Just visit us at TonyEvans.org, make a contribution to help us keep Tony's teaching on the station, and we'll send you both of these powerful resources as our way of saying thanks. Remember, we depend completely on your support to continue this important ministry. You can find us at TonyEvans.org or reach out to our Resource Center by calling 1-800-800-3222. Team members are standing by around the clock to help with your resource request. Again, that's 1-800-800-3222. Well, next time, we have a special treat for you. We are airing the first in a series of messages called Tony Evans' Top 40, 40 Powerful Sermons Over 40 Years. These are some of the messages that have made a huge impact during the course of our work here, and you won't want to miss them. Be sure to join us. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is celebrating 40 years of faithfulness thanks to the generous contributions of listeners like you. 